I first met Jorge in St. Louis at a concert. Um, I had always admired his uh, compositions and his playing. And when I heard he was playing in St. Louis, I couldn't wait to go. So uh, after the concert, I waited outside and uh, met him. And I introduced myself and said, you know, I'd really love to publish your works and uh, or some of your items. And uh, he, typical Jorge, he was so enthusiastic. He said, oh yeah, let's do it. Fine, let's go. So uh, he was uh, a publisher's dream. Uh, no matter, I think comp composing came easy to him. And no matter what I suggested, uh, uh, he'd come up with it right away. I, uh, I'd say, for example, uh, how about doing some uh, solos on different Latin American rhythms? Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, how about tangos and milongas? Oh yeah, well he did two books on that. And I remember when salsa was uh, very popular, I said, well, you, would you like to do something on that? Sure, absolutely. So we did that. And uh, so he ended up writing uh, many, many books for us. Um, one book I'd, I'd like to mention, uh, John McClellan did, and it's called uh, uh, The Magnificent Guitar of uh, Jorge Morel, A Life in Music. And the reason I mention that one, in addition to it having all kinds of his well-known solos, um, John did a lot of interviews with, with Jorge, and so Jorge talked about his life even from the early days of in music. And that's a very interesting read, I think. Um, so when I was on the board of uh, GFA, Guitar Foundation of America, I suggested that they uh, uh, include Jorge in their Hall of Fame. Uh, and they voted yes, yes, to do that. And I had the pleasure of calling him and uh, telling him uh, that uh, he had been elected to the GFA Hall of Fame, and he was absolutely thrilled. Uh, uh, he kept thanking me and thanking me, and uh, I, I was thinking, you know, what a wonderfully humble man uh, he was. Very gracious, uh, very gracious. And uh, so he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and uh, uh, overall, I'd say he carved kind of a new path. Uh, not only uh, did classical guitarists, his music was so not only melodic, but rhythmical. And uh, uh, all kinds of audiences, audiences who uh, weren't familiar with classical guitar literature, uh, jazz guitarists, uh, everybody, when they heard his music, they, it just, it was so vibrant and alive. So uh, uh, I feel it was an honor to work with him and what a, what a pleasure he was to work with. Very, very gracious man, he's sorely missed.
Hello, my name is Hilary Field, and I am so honored to be here tonight to be part of the celebration of the life of the great Jorge Morel. I'd like to thank Michael Newman and Laura Altman and the New York Guitar Seminar at Manus for organizing this and for this kind invitation. And I'd like to thank everyone who is joining tonight in this celebration. Jorge Morel is one of my most favorite guitarists, composers, and people in the entire world. And I feel blessed to have the opportunity to play his music, to play music that he composed for me, and also to call him my friend. His memory will live on through his music and through his beautiful children, Francesca and Jorge, through his loving family and friends, and through the joy that he brings people all over the world with his music and with his kindness. Jorge Morel has had great tragedy in his life, and he's also had great joy and beauty, and he has brought great joy and beauty into this world. I'd like to now read a quote, one of my favorite quotes of his. This is from the book, The Magnificent Guitar of Jorge Morel. We must laugh in life. One should take life seriously, of course, but we must laugh, drink good wine, play good music, and remember good things. Thank you, Jorge, for your beautiful spirit and for everything that you have given to the world of music. The piece that I would like to play for you tonight is a piece that he wrote for me. And I was pretty excited when I received this in the mail and I opened the package and I saw the title said, For Hillary. So that is the piece that I'll play for you tonight. And in this music, you'll hear the sound of his South American heritage, and you'll also hear the influence of Baroque music and J.S. Bach. It is in two movements, and the second movement is in five parts. Thank you again for joining in this celebration, and enjoy the music.
Hello and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back at Manus Festival. Uh, wanna, we want to thank Michael and Laura for uh, the gigantic effort to put in this festival and making it possible. Um, we're especially honored to be part of this tribute uh, that so thoughtfully has been put to celebrate the life and the work of Maestro Jorge Morel. It's especially personal for us because we knew him so well and he became a big part of our life because I actually met him a long time ago um, before yeah. I came to the United States uh, I met him in 1995 so officially it was last century <laughs> <laughs> uh, he came to the Poland to the festival it was a f festival and competition in the little town in the south of Poland of Krynice and it's named after Czeslav Drozdevich. I think that festival and competition is still going on. And he played a concert and I met him and I played for a masterclass for him. And I remember what impressed me is that, uh, you know, of course I saw many other guitar concerts by then, but what impressed me is that when he came to the stage, he, how to say it, he owned the stage. It was like, it was a uh, something special in the air. It was a show. It was a classical show. He was helped to get to the stage. He already had his back problems. But once he was in the chair, he transformed. Really, it was a different man. It was a man with a guitar mm. uh, who spoke through the guitar. And he played the pieces, some of him, his pieces, some arranged pieces that really spoke to people and you know how music touches us who knows but it was something that everybody was absolutely um like was a standing ovation of course yeah it was a very special night i and i remember it very very well um what do you remember about besides that personal thing well after the concert of course I had terrible guitar at the time <laughs> <laughs> and after the concert I was very curious Maestro, what guitar do you have? Um, <laughs> and he said, well, I have this friend in New York City who is an owner of a guitar store, of course, Tony Acosta 
So if you ever come to New York, he would help you find a very fine instrument and you would be surprised that not for you know, a couple thousand dollars you can get quite a nice instrument, which for me a couple thousand dollars at that time was <laughs> enormous <laughs> amount of yes, money. A different reality. <laughs> yeah, actually, right. And, and then... <laughs> And look what happened. Yeah, look what Life happened. Like turn around and right. you end up having a guitar from Tony Acosta. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah, it's incredible. And we got to know Jorge really uh, close in, in a very personal way. Another thing I remember, but maybe I can say it later, um, in the master class, it was another revelation for me. Somebody was playing his Danza Brasileira. And, uh, you know, all the participants there were from... Europe and uh, in Europe Latin American rhythms are very loved they are considered exotic they excite people but we really don't know that well what are the rhythms and what's real the core of the, core of the rhythms are and I remember she it was a girl playing and he told her you know you're playing very well but you have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him do that. <laughs> you have an accent in this piece. And and I was very, very curious about that comment. And since then I was very sensitive to really try to listen to what makes a rhythm rhythm. And of course, some people over there play a little bit too free. They slow down, they speed up when, when it is a samba. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and of course with you, I never can play the rhythms correctly, <laughs> but I try, and I oh, think I, I did get better. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah. So, and then of course we met him in New York because, and then that was that's a kind of second chapter, when uh, when we moved to New York when City. You, we moved to New York City. It was early two thousands. After we went, after we graduated. graduated from Yale, we came to New York City, and uh, you. Uh, were doing your second masters in education in music education at Lehman College and then and then you found out and I saw I happened to look at the roster of, of the faculty mm -hmm. and I saw her model listed yeah. as a guitar professor um, now a guitar as a solo instrument um, was not necessarily a, a mandatory class for my curriculum for music education but uh, immediately uh, when I came back home I remember telling Lina Guess who is in the roster of the faculty at Lehman College? Yeah, and, and I say who? And he <laughs> said, Jorge Morales, like, wow. <laughs> Small world. So mm -hmm. uh, immediately we jumped to the idea of, of talking. I, I talked to the administration to see if I could take some classes with him. And I remember calling him over the phone and scheduling a lesson was on a Saturday um, at his home. He, he, would, he did no longer... Uh, taught commute. commute to Lehman College, mm -hmm. he, the students would go to his house in, in mm -hmm. Forest Hills in Queens. Beautiful apartment that we visit so many, so many times. And remember going there and, and performing for him. And he was so welcoming and, and his, his smile was so inviting that uh, I never something, forget. But that's something that always happened with him. He always made you feel at ease, didn't he? Yeah, always. Always, always, and and actually, I to to be truthful, I was not very aware of many of the pieces of Morel mm -hmm. before I met him. Mm -hmm. I only heard Morel pieces through you. Actually, mm -hmm. actually, he was quite known in uh, well in the former uh, Soviet, Soviet Union, Union because he maybe through Poland somehow he was traveling to even he was in Russia a couple times um, and he was uh, traveling to Japan and in Greece and uh, like in many European countries and somehow uh, people got uh, hands on his music and people played Danza Brasileira and Danza in E and uh, some other of his pieces and of course romance that you hear today which is absolutely gorgeous piece absolutely beautiful that is i'm not sure you should tell them uh, a little bit about the story about that piece I, i'm not sure how many people know about the piece and and you were lucky enough to know firsthand from well, him he told me that he it was actually written for the movie but unfortunately the movie was never made 
So, uh, but we have a absolutely gorgeous uh, piece on the guitar that is really a jewel of guitar repertoire. It's my personal opinion. Um, and of course, it was written with the thought of his wife, who unfortunately passed tragically away at a young when, age when yes. she was very young and left him and a young daughter behind. So, what's how were your interaction like? What was your lessons with 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 Jorge like? I only really have one lesson. <laughs> After that lesson, it was just about drinking wine, <laughs> talking. And just, you know, he, I would play for him and, he, and then he would suggest and tell me all kind of musical ideas. And he was, as many of us are, know, not only a very successful composer, but also a, a quite an accomplished guitarist. Yes. And he will all put videos and recordings of him performing when he was younger. And, and I could, you know, I was floored pretty much. Yeah, seeing, we were really him. surprised. Uh, see him perform at such a high level and all the stories that he would tell us about um, his when he was touring with uh, Columbia, Columbia Records, Records. And, and when he was playing at the Village Gate so he was a he was a showman mm -hmm. above, the, above the whole and that ties very closely to what you felt when you heard him the first time in in, mm -hmm. in Poland he he, he was um, our, my experience, our experience with Noel, I, I, I think I can speak for both Absolutely. of us, that goes far beyond just a regular lesson. It was like a life experience. And, you know, it's... And I'm sure it was for you. Like, Yeah, he was more like a mentor. Uh, yeah. When he would uh, say... You know, I remember... Because we used to go to his... We got very friendly. And we used to go to his apartment every Saturday night when he invites him, us, and Tony, and sometimes people come to, Thiago to town. De Melo, Thiago de Me yes. Juanito Acosta, uh, Juan de la Mata. Uh, Juan de la Mata. Me. Yes. Um, every major guitarist that will be touring through New York City will come and visit mm -hmm. him. And he will cook an arroz con pollo. Mm -hmm. for all of us and drink wine until like 2, 3 in the morning yeah, yeah, yeah. performing <laughs> remember that fire? That we, 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 <laughs> oh yes say that story that story is hilarious mm, go ahead uh, he was you know his apartment in, in, in Forest Hill was fairly small but big enough for all of us uh, so in his kitchen we could barely feed depending on how many of us were there and he by the window he would put this little uh, George Foreman grill that he had and and once like you know he will always go a little bit earlier then he will ask us to go to the Argentinian uh, Place, beef butchery. store butchery whatever it's like to buy a Martinian meat cut in a specific way oh. that is like so it was very it was a ritual so and, and then he was working cooking the steak in by the window and it started getting a lot of smoke and and some people thought it was a fire and called the 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 police or the firefighters i don't know 911 probably and they show up to to the door and then and then jorge with the fork was trying to to get them to, to, to try the to steak get to camp this to is argentina <laughs> argentinian cut you will never have a steak like this one <laughs> right yeah that it's, was funny it was a very very special um but he was really more like a mentor because, you know, when you would play, he would kind of say this kind of life, uh, big life ideas rather than, you know, oh, put this finger there or yeah, you know, was, make this phrase that way. He he was more like, you know, broad. It was not so specific. Broad, like, like it is for us. Yeah. yeah with, obviously. with the, you know, other students, it was obviously different. Yeah. What was the most important advice or, or something that for you stands up in, in like what you remember that influenced you and somehow? Well, there are many. It's very difficult to pinpoint one. But one that I usually say to my students was um, when I was trying to record my debut recording, you know, I wanted to put my mark and, and play all this Rodrigo repertoire and, and very 
standard, but not only a standard, but also a staples of our of our repertoire. And and Morel, like, would say, well, but why? Why would you want to do that? Like, and I say, what do you mean, why? Uh, because the pieces are great, and because uh, I want to show people that like what I can do. And he, and he said, well, that's that's the wrong way to see the whole thing. First of all, there are many people playing that music already. And how would recording this will make you stand up from the rest? And that made me thought, like, I, I think, I, I remember being like, hmm, he, he's right. How is that going to make me be any different than any other recording? And, and how would make people want to buy the recording versus... And it was not about the money, obviously, but, you know, you're leaving a statement behind, you know, an artistic statement. And is that the first artistic statement that I want to have out there and, and well little by little he kind of walked me towards the idea of playing uh, music that is significantly special for me and since I left Cuba since uh, 1995 um, I, I was, thought it was more than fitting to play music from my country so my debut recording ended up happening um, and of course, Thanks it's just naturally that this is the kind of music that you can relate more than people uh, that yeah. were not born in Cuba, and it's it's just a natural. And I think also because he related to that music as well, because he he used he, to live in Cuba. He did a pilgrimage all over. When he left to Argentina, he went through different countries, Venezuela, and everything, and and then end up living in Cuba, and then from there moved to Puerto Rico. To Puerto Rico, and then from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico to New York. He went to New York. So he he was. Uh, I, I would say, like, the second half of the century, the barrios of the second half of the century, you know, in which I don't know any other guitarist that actually travel and perform so much through Latin America all the way to, to the Caribbean and then moving to New York City and then Europe. So I never quite thought of it that way, but I think it's safe to say that he was following in his own way, you know, uh, the nomad type of life of, of Barrios had at some point experiencing and absorbing mm -hmm. the cultures of every yeah, and country. And tapping in his roots and uh, yeah. making it his own. Actually, you know, one of the features that I felt like that, you know, there are always something that surprises you about Jorge. <laughs> one thing that like he would always say, okay, like in the evening, we would come on Saturday evening and he's like, okay, what did I do today? And I was like, wow, you know, it's powerful. What did I do today? And every day, like he had always his routine because sometimes he would stay in his house if we were too late. And in the morning he has had his coffee, he had a routine. And then after he had his breakfast, he would go and work. If it's playing or if it's composing, but he would go and work. Then maybe he would have a lunch, uh, he would he call would, Francesca. He would, he would go walk, he would talk to Francesca, and then in the second half of the day he may, may continue, or he may, you know, just um, go to some other engagements that he, he needed to do. And, mm -hmm. and that was very special for me. I, I don't know, I, I thought it was... And, you know... Like, what did I do today? And that... It's like you're taking one day as if it's like micro life so to say yeah he was he was running check of Muhammad himself mm -hmm. and see what he achieved and, you know? he and his age that's mm -hmm. admirable yeah. and he always made you feel welcomed welcomed and comfortable and like you know he's like come on Elena go play something <laughs> there <laughs> will be so much music in his living room I know. every and it was just natural the it, only time it, music will get interrupted if his argentina was playing soccer oh yeah that <laughs> that would be the only way yeah. that could stop guitar yes. in that house and composing and teaching and and being all the way surrounded by music and yeah. love remember that bible story <laughs> yes <laughs> oh you tell it me okay. yeah yeah he had some Cyst, it was a so, cyst. Some, something on the nail or on, or the, on the hand and he went to the doctor and the doctor obviously was Argentinian and <laughs> they did some tests some physical therapy and 
it wouldn't go away and the doctor would say so did 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 it does it bother you does it and he says no it's just like it's present <laughs> it's like the, and then the Jorge told told us the doctor said hit it with the bible <laughs> yes it's what, i don't remember the medical term or whatever it was but like it i know that if you hit it hard and, and sudden like it, it kind of like it disappears not immediately like it, the swollen goes and then it, it disappears so it's our ongoing joke since then like, hit it with the bible hit it with the bible any problem any big problem hit it with whatever, the bible whatever is not working <laughs> hit it with the bible yes you know and also about how special was uh, to hear about his concert tours his, yeah. his experience around the world and talking about every day yes every day we went to visit him yes. for many years yes. he would always remember Olga yes. you know and to the point that his his eyes will yeah. you know watery almost crying to the mm -hmm. crying point and how he was faithful to her for all these years you know that's true it was not a single time that we were with him that he would not remember her so Morel was more than a guitarist for us was a mentor a father figure a friend a confident and and this is a his passing is a very big loss for both of us yeah, and it's yeah. unfortunate because we were really looking forward to his 90th birthday. Yes. And we really hesi short. <laughs> hesitated to, and we didn't go for Christmas to see him because of COVID. And, um, yeah. and look what. Look what happened. Yeah. So he was a special man. Um, what can you say? Uh, about Morel, the, the guitar population and audience, the guitarists, wouldn't necessarily know that we haven't said already. What can we say about him? Well, for me, mm, good question. I think how loving he was to his family to his mm. to people that he really loved like Francesca his son. what special friendship he had with Tony um, and and Rebecca. Uh, and Rebecca and um, Juan de la Mata when he was alive Tiago de Mello Tiago de Mello when he was alive uh, he was really a man from the heart he lived from the heart he unified people. He and, uh, bring all these yes. people together yes. every Saturday to celebrate life, yes. the joy of being alive, the joy of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good observation. And they were all very different, but they just were the way they were in each other's presence, and it was beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. I feel I don't know. I'm sure you too like no, privileged. No, that's, that's very that's very special. I yes. think privileged that we got to know him to that got level. Got to know him to that level and that he um, opened to us to be yeah. in this first closest level of friends. Then of course when we moved to Milwaukee it was harder to visit him. But we kept in and touch. We kept in touch and we went to Orlando. He moved to Orlando because uh, um, well he, he we couldn't keep up uh, as close eye anymore being so far away yeah, and he, he moved, moved closer to the daughter to to Francesca. Right. and um, yeah mm. yeah he it, it, we did you're right we're very lucky to not know only not knowing him only as a composer and guitarist mm -hmm. but as a friend and like the like voice of wisdom a person, yeah. yeah. The humanity of him was what made his music very sincere. Mm -hmm. And he, um, one thing I will say, like he, he would take special care and attention into naming his pieces. Mm -hmm. He will think and think and think until he will come out with a name that he will identify. So if you're playing any of his music, um, try to, if if 
if there is a story behind the name of the piece try to figure it out because that will get you to be a little closer to what meant for Jorge so he in my opinion uh, is one of the best guitarists on the second half of the of the 20th century absolutely and he a little bit under the radar maybe yes but he but he was and and always amazing how humble he was about it he will never make you feel that there was a distance between him and he, uh, uh, and you that's true you know like he's, he's and he was extremely inspiring yeah every day extremely inspiring so um this this tribute we're sure it's gonna be an extension to what his life was full of love appreciation stories laughter you know because uh, we laughed a lot too you know it's a little bit of a sad moment for us but we laughed a lot in his company and we um, rejoice in the fact of being alive and being able to live from playing guitar and, 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 and cultivating and our love just for his personality he was always so happy <laughs> yes he was always so happy and uplifting uplifting yeah. very so uncanny to have that <laughs> <laughs> Jorge if you listen we miss you I miss our phone calls we miss our get-togethers uh, but we'll keep we'll keep you alive through your music just like you would have loved and you were with <laughs>
Hello everybody, this is Jenny Rafikaya. Uh, I want to share a couple of thoughts about Maestro Jorge Morel. Maestro was always my idol as a guitarist and as a composer. And when I was growing up in Istanbul and studying guitar, I always um, played Maestro's music in my concerts, in the competitions, uh, whenever I can, because he was my you know, favorite composer. And when I came to New York City, um, to study at Menace, uh, my former teacher Michael Newman told me that he, he lived in Queens and I was living in Queens at that time and we visited him and I had a great chance and privilege to meet him and share his friendship and understand his musicianship and um, understand his music. Finally, I had a great chance and um, honor to record his music for Naxos Records while he was alive. And I'm glad I did it and I really think it made him really happy. And it was a great honor for me to record my favorite composer's music. I really hope more musicians and young generation guitarists play his music, appreciates his music, uh, even more than today.
Hola amigos, soy Virginia Luque. I just wanted to share some experiences uh, that I had with Jorge Morel, how I met him, and maybe some, I'm trying just to be as brief as possible so I can just explain to you how important was meeting him for me as a friend and as a colleague. Uh, he was, um, I met him uh, through Juan Orozco at his workshop. He, uh, Juan Orozco, El Señor Orozco, was very, very eager for me to just meet him. I heard about him in Spain a long time ago um, when I was a student. And uh, of course, I heard his music and I heard about him. So it was really very exciting for me to really meet him. And um, what I did was I, the first minute I met him, um, it was like I, I knew him for a very, very long time. So I played a little bit for him uh, because he insisted and um, Mr. Orozco as well. So, and then I went to um, <clears throat> his home and, uh, and then everything started. He started pulling books and everything. And I played uh, the first piece I remember it was Danza Brasileira and it got in my head Oh, I just couldn't really uh, uh, get it out of my head. So I had a concert three days after then. And, uh, and I said, I'm going to give it a try. Why not? Maybe the students will like it. Well, who's sitting in the front row? Jorge Morel. So it, it was something not to try anymore. But it was really wonderful because it came out good. And he was happy. He just wrote some comment on classical guitar magazine but anyway so that was my first experience uh, then we became very very close um, Tony Acosta was also uh, joining us and uh, we were the three of us like the three musketeers you know I was going to Tony's home or just Jorge's home and then we decided to play together so uh, we played some duets he was making uh, some tangos uh, because you know I loved Argentinian music and and I said to him you know I want I want to have a really wonderful tangos and so he made uh, some triunfal melancólico Buenos Aires um, contratiempo he did la trampera and he did also Triana and um, that was when I just came to this country so that was just that impact you know you can imagine so we performed in town hall I I also played one piece, actually wrote a piece uh, for two guitars, Alma Argentina, which I actually um, asked Jorge to revise it because it was in the Argentinian style and I just wanted to make sure that it, I wasn't doing any anything very Spanish uh, from Spain. So, so I decided to I decided to do to do that and we performed it. Actually, we recorded it together too, and afterwards, uh, Tony Acosta. Um, uh, did the this uh, recording that unfortunately didn't come out because of technical work but nowadays we can just repair anything and uh, we can just um, we're going to release it this year uh, with all the permissions all the permits and everything so um, after that I took I don't know I took my path he took his path and then all of a sudden we, um, I was playing a con I was going to play a concert in New Jersey, and Bertoncini was there, and uh, Bertoncini said to me, Vir Vir Virginia, you know, you know with whom I'm talking right now? I said no. Then he said, well, just get on the phone, and he was, Jorge Morel. Oh my God! And, well, we were just very excited. So we talked about, we talked about that we were hungry of each other, you know, and we were talking and talking and talking. I said, listen, I have to talk, I have to play a concert, and then later I'll, I'll, I'll call you. And by the way, I'm going to do an, an homage to, to you with all, um, in, in my gold catalog composers, we're going to do a double album and blah, blah, blah. So and then we continue doing that. I went to, I went to um, his home. I stayed there for two weeks at a time working in detail all the pieces he took this project so so intensely because um he wanted to do revisions that he didn't do for a very very long time 
and I thought it was a great idea. So I could actually absorb all, all his desires in the last moment. So we did that and uh, every time I, when I came back home, I was, I was actually uh, calling him and checking the music, if it was okay or not, whatever. And so that was one thing. And um, after that, uh, we put it all together. I decided, well, uh, oh, by the way, I have two premieres there, which was Introduction Petit and Sanjiga, which was the first piece he wrote. And then the second piece was Estampas Latinas, that gives the name to the CD. So uh, after that, I decided, I said, you know what? I want, I want to be able just to, to get more music from you. Would, you. would you write music for me? And he said, yes. So I said, okay, fine. So I became his patron and I, I asked to, for a solo piece. And then he did Recuerdos Argentinos, which was the solo piece that he wrote, uh, the last solo piece. And then uh, because he was doing his work from the keyboard th um, due to uh, his physical condition, he couldn't really hold the guitar, I decided to do um, to request more music orchestra uh, in in the orchestra form, and he said, "Well, that's a great idea. So I would like that." So so he did a, a quintet first. It was um, called Virginia's Quintet, and um, for a string quartet and and guitar, and then uh, two concertos. One concerto that was um, Estampas del Sur, and and the second one was actually not a concerto because he insisted that it wasn't. It wasn't in that form, but it was an orchestra piece called Rhapsodia, which actually became the last piece that he wrote, unfortunately, for all of us. And um, what can I say about my experience with him is that I miss my friend, and because I, miss, I missed him so much, I did uh, a website for him, and uh, jorgemorel.org. I, I put together everything I could, all his music, all his extensive catalog and arrangements, and also all the photographs, along with Francesca, his daughter, uh, who was sending me mus um, photographs and all the information that he, she could. And, and I was very, very, um, I'm working very intensely for three months. But the most important thing is just to keep his legacy alive. So what I'm trying to do is to keep all his music um, available. And uh, some music that are not published anymore, we want to do downloads so people can actually have uh, access to that music. Um, and uh, also uh, orchestra works uh, as well. But that will take a little bit of more time. We're trying just to um, uh, reorganize everything and being able just to um, to have it available for everyone. Um, what can I say? My work with him was very different because I never thought that I was going to be revising anything or uh, working in that sense. But I knew him so well. I knew how his composition was, was going and in the way that the structure and everything, his desires. But I always check with him and say, okay, what, is this what it is? Because obviously from the keyboard to the guitar, it's, it's a big, big change. And, uh, and that is what I was trying just to, to get his approval, you know, about those things. So my work has been so different, but I cannot say that it was not exciting. And that I hope that I can keep his legacy alive and, and keep his um, memory forever for all of us that loved him very much. I really uh, want to thank him for allowing me to do that. And thank you to all of you for uh, being part of this homage. Thank you.
Good evening. Um, it's such an honor to be with you all this evening, celebrating the life of, of Jorge Morel. Jorge said that the keys to a great life or a happy life are to love your family, your friends, drink good wine, eat great food, and to enjoy good music. And he certainly loved Frank Sinatra, talked about Frank all the time when we were together. And... Um, I think that Jorge lived his long life by following those principles, and uh, I'm just very honored to be with you all this evening. Uh, my earliest memories of Jorge were through the arrangements of his that Chet Atkins recorded back in the 1960s, and uh, I always admired Jorge's arrangements. Of course, I love Chet. That's the common ground between Jorge and myself is Chet Atkins. Uh, Chet was a friend of mine, and I've done five books on Chet and 10 DVDs dedicated to Chet's music and techniques. And, and, uh, and it was through Chet that I was exposed to Jorge. And uh, I remember someone gave me, I was probably about 13 or 14 years old, gave me Jorge's two Decca records, which is, you must have these. You can get them on eBay. I believe they're by Decca, the warm guitar and the magnificent guitar of Jorge Morel. Uh, talk about smoke coming out of the guitars, just unbelievable. You can find them on eBay, but you got to hear those. This is a young Jorge who was just unbelievable. The arrangements are great. The playing was the articulation, the spontaneity, the color, everything about those recordings is just off the chart. So if you really want to understand Jorge's playing, you need to hear those 1961 Decca recordings. They're, they're incredible. And I, I was exposed to those at an early age. And uh, something comes to mind, I remember uh, in, in, in the book that Jorge and I did together, The Magnificent Guitar of Jorge Morales, published by Mel Bay, uh, talking to Jorge about those records. And he said, yeah, I, I did those sessions to do those two records. I did pretty much everything in the first take. Of course, that's impressive by any standard. And he said, well, you know, I, I was listen, I've listened to them. I was kind of impressed too, because that was over 40 years ago, I guess technically 50 years ago and uh, for us now. But 40 years ago when he told me this, he said... Uh, I guess I could do that when I was a young man, but uh, Jorge is probably the most authentic person that I've met in my life. He would give you the shirt off his back. He would laugh at himself. He was just, I think the core of who he was is just, a, just, a, just he was just a wonderful, wonderful man who loved everybody and it came through in his playing. And uh, I have a humorous story to tell you. In 2002, we did a tribute to Chet Atkins at the Sheldon Concert Hall here in St. Louis. And uh, Jorge flew in from New York and Tommy Emanuel came and, 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 and we did a big show, big tribute to Chet who had passed away the previous summer. 
and everybody played, and we, we saved Jorge for last because uh, you don't follow Jorge on stage. You just don't because he will, he will bury you. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. Um, all the college guitar students were there that night, setting up in the balcony at Sheldon and in the back of the room. And Jorge came out and just destroyed. I mean, he just smoked everybody. And people were yelling, standing on their feet. And, you know, Jorge played like Missionera and all these pieces we associate with Jorge and just nailed them. And, I mean, to use a southern vernacular, people were throwing babies up in the air. It was just unbelievable. Um, and I, I, I was backstage after Jorge came off and, you know, and you know, mm. Tommy Emanuel was back there and Tommy was like a little kid, had, had uh, Jorge autographed the top of his guitar. And I'll never forget this. All these students came backstage and, I, I, and they were just shaking their heads. And I looked at them and I said, how does it feel to have your ass kicked by a 70-year-old man? And they just they shook their heads and said, yeah. They were pretty humbled by that experience. But I, I just, I, that was something that comes to mind because I thought it was really uh, very humorous. So, uh, um, so many stories. When Jorge would fly from New York to St. Louis. This would have been in the early to mid-2000s to work with myself and Dean Braddock on, on his book. We made a road trip down to Nashville to play on the Chet Atkins Convention together, and uh, we were roommates, and we had just unbelievable, unbelievable conversations. Just, just, uh, it was really something special to me. So, I, um, I think about you know uh, just the impact he's had on my life, and there's just too many stories. For me to to recall just now, but um, I will tell you this: as I don't want, I am going to play a piece that Jorge wrote. I asked Jorge to write for our book. Um, uh, you know, he had just recently had told me the story of Olga's passing and 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 you know and the circumstances surrounding that. And I asked him. I said, you know, I know you wrote the prelude. To Olga, but can you write a, a, a suite of pieces? And the first one is called Olga. Followed, and he'd never, he said he'd never written a fugue, so I asked him to write a fugue, and he wrote a, a jig. And so I'm going to play here very soon uh, Olga. And uh, he, he really loved how I played it, so that's, I thought it was appropriate to play that now. But um, he, um, he was prolific. When I, Deanne and I would ask him for music, some more pieces to put in the book, those pieces would occur like a week later. And so um, i just so honored to, to know Jorge. I considered him my second father. And um, the last gift he gave me probably was about two years ago. He, uh, paint, you know, late in his life, he was really, he was painting, you know, art. And he sent me a painting I have framed. It's down in my living room, and it's one of my most cherished possessions that he did that for me. So I'll now play Olga from the Olga Suite that was premiered in the Magnificent Guitar of Jorge Morel book. And uh, I hope you all have a great evening and, and enjoy celebrating the life of our friend Jorge.
Hi, Michael and Laura. Thank you very much for asking me to say a few words to your tribute to my old friend, Jorge Morel. I played the guitar since 1955 when I was 15 years old, and I soon became fascinated by the incredible artistry of the great guitar virtuosos and all styles of music. I was a jazz guitarist with a deep love of both jazz and classical music. This love also extended to South American music. In 1979, I knew well the recordings of the guitarists Lorinda Almeida, Baden Powell, Louis Bonfa, Eduardo Falou, Jorge Cardoso, and many others. I had at that time, much to my amazement now, never heard of Jorge Morel. All that changed after hearing Jorge play in concert for around 30 minutes at the NAM 1979 convention in Chicago. I was at the annual NAM dinner and concert in the company of my late friend, guitarist Ivan Mirance. We sat at a table with Luthier Jose Ramirez III, guitar string maker Juan Orozco and others. The half hour concert spot before Jorge's guitar solo recital was played by a 16 piece excellent big band in the style of the Count Basie Orchestra. I remember commenting to Iva what bad programming it was to put a solo guitarist on after such a great big band. Well, I was wrong. I was privileged to hear some of the most amazing guitar playing and wonderful guitar arrangements that I'd ever heard. Jorge's recital received rapturous applause from the very large audience, and so it was, Jorge Morel entered my life. As it turned out, Ivan knew Jorge and Juan Orozco was his friend, so the great guitarist joined us at our table after his concert. I took the opportunity there and then to ask Jorge if he would like to make a recording for my new Guitar Masters Records label in the UK. And, as they say, the rest is history. Within a short period of time, Jorge Morel was in the UK for the first of what would be many visits, and I produced a virtuoso South American guitar, the first of his three amazing solo guitar recordings for my Guitar Masters records. I also presented Jorge in concert in the first of many recitals that he would give over the next few years in London and in several other UK cities. We became firm friends and from that time on were in regular contact. I also had the privilege to publish 15 volumes of Jorge's original music and arrangements with the title Virtuoso South American Guitar through my Ashley Mark Publishing Company. Jorge was also a valued contributor to my monthly magazine, Classical Guitar. I will always treasure the memory of the many times we spent together, both in New York and in the UK. I was delighted to introduce Jorge to David Russell, Mario Macaferri, Barry Mason, Lorindo Almeida, Bill Barr, Juan Bartin, and many other guitar notables. I'm confident Jorge Morel will live on through the great treasure trove of original compositions, guitar arrangements, and historic recordings that he has given to us. Thank you again for asking me to say a few words.